And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's universe as we again explore the intricacies of the Catholic faith uh, with Father Spitzer. I'm Doug Keck here live from our EWTN studios in the heart of the mothership, Irondale, Alabama. We begin our journey each week and it's only possible because you send us your emails and you send us questions on Facebook or you tweet us on Twitter. And you can also go to Father Spitzer's website, magiscenterwebsite.com. And of course, also, we're talking through CredibleCatholic.com, a new uh, expression of Father's teaching apostolate that's available on the web. That's what we've been working through today. Our topic, evolution, the Bible, and science. Yes, they all fit together and they all work. Uh, and we're going to show you how that is. And just a reminder that EW10 has been working all year to set up for our next EW10 family celebration. Check it out coming up in uh, November, a little later this year, November 3rd in Jacksonville, Florida. We hope to see all our friends there, our media missionaries, everybody else. Uh, Chris Stefanik, Jeanette Bankovic uh, Williams is going to be there, the one and only Father Mitch Pacwa, and uh, a lot of other people from EW10 will be there. We hope to see you. A wonderful family celebration. Mother Angelica always wanted EWTN to be seen as a family. Another member of our extended family is out on the West Coast. It's one and only Father Spitzer out at our Orange County, California studios. And as we kick things off, once again, Father, could you lead us in a prayer? Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the revelation that you have given us through the universe around us its perfect mathematical symmetries, its beauty, its, its uh, capacity to keep us fully alive and developing, its, its uh, uh, dimensions of, of nature that, that call us to you. We ask you, Lord, that as we perceive this through the eyes of science and through the eyes of aesthetics, through the eyes of faith, that we'll be able to see your hand blending together faith and reason and beauty. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to uh, move off of near-death experiences and moving into questions related to evolution the Bible and science, which uh, mm -hmm. is in one of your modules, module three, towards the end mm -hmm. of our Credible Catholic. CredibleCatholic.com is where you can go and get that all of that information. So we have some interesting mm -hmm. questions that came in. Person wrote to us. I think we decided to get this one onto a show because we got it a while ago, and we wanted to make sure okay. we were fair to everybody. So we put this on for Chuck. Dear Father, a few months ago, you commented about an alien being who Satan would tempt into sin and that when the alien died, he would be judged by God. Do you believe there are other beings in the vast universe? Is it a universal law that all life throughout the universe must die eventually? God bless you. Please give an update to all of us on your eye condition, which uh, a lot of people have been asking about, okay. and I'm remiss in not asking you to give an update, Father. Uh, well, I'll do that at the end of the answer, mm -hmm. but uh, first of all, are there uh, alien beings? Uh, you have to differentiate between, uh, you know, what do you mean by alien life, right? Uh, if you're really meaning an intelligent alien life, let me hold off on that for just one second. Let me move first. Is there life somewhere else in the universe? Uh, there could be life somewhere in the universe. The Catholic Church is certainly open to that possibility. Uh, we know that there probably are somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 to the 11th. That's quite a few. 10 to the, that's uh, a one with 11 zeros after it. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 to the 11th, what we call exoplanets that may be capable of sustaining a life form. Now, that's... Uh, that's really liberally viewed, right? So uh, those exoplanets, that just means that they're like the Earth in the, it's, it, in the planet's position away from a star or a mm -hmm. sun. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the, the, the sun or the star will not eradicate life. It'll be able to have an atmosphere, et cetera. But there's so mm -hmm. many other things that have to be in place as well. You need an iron core to give rise, right? So that the, that the magnetic rays from the sun can actually magnetize that core 
core, and, and, and that core can in turn produce the magnetic radiation that's going to protect us from the sun's solar flares, mm -hmm. et cetera. So all these things, right, are, are uh, you know, other things that have to be considered. Nevertheless, there are probably a good number of planets that may be able to sustain a life form out there. So the Catholic Church says, yes, we just open, uh, we're open to the possibility, mm -hmm. and if, if there's a life form out there, uh, great. Uh, if there's not a life form out there, well, great. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't think the Catholic Church has a, a real uh, stake in that game per se, uh, but of course is always open to, the, to new discoveries. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go to the area of intelligent life, mm -hmm. that is a whole other area, because if you mean intelligence like we have intelligence, mm -hmm. that is a very different thing. So like, how do we have intelligence? We have what's called our uh, five uh, transcendental desires mm -hmm. per for perfect truth, perfect love, perfect beauty, perfect goodness or justice, and perfect mm -hmm. being or home. Now those five transcendental desires, there's a whole proof uh, in module three mm -hmm. that those transcendental desires didn't come from anything physical, they didn't come from our brain, they didn't come from the material world, we didn't learn it from the material world because after all, it, where did we get our awareness of perfect love? Well, mm -hmm. there's no examples of perfect love out in the world that I know of mm -hmm. except for God mm -hmm. and so the first thing you got to say is it wasn't something physical that revealed perfect love to us. Where did we get our sense of perfect truth so that we would want to know the complete set of correct answers, the complete set of questions? Well, we didn't get it from something material out mm -hmm. in the empirical world, right? We, we, we clearly uh, didn't get it from our brain. We're going to have to get it from a trans-physical source, a trans-physical cause, because, right, remember, the cause and effect have to be commensurate with one another. Mm -hmm. You can't have a, a cause that won't produce a transcendent effect like the awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. So God's got to be kind of communicating to us mm -hmm. in our souls. And that's, Augustine actually had these beautiful proofs. He came out with them a, a long time ago uh, on the five transcendental desires, which actually go back to Plato. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. You know, if you find a being that has a transphysical soul uh, that survives bodily death, and last week we were just talking about near-death experiences, and we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, people surviving bodily mm -hmm. death and going to a, another domain. Well, if you go and ask this alien being, hey, have you ever, uh, uh, you know, had uh, experience of, of, you know, being conscious after clinical death, and the alien being goes, yeah, I have. Well, then they have a soul like us. If you say, hey, have you ever had an experience, uh, or, uh, had the awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, and the alien being goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I have. And then if you say, uh, you already know that, that that being has what we call conceptual ideas, which already require some kind of transphysical activity, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's a whole other proof unto itself, right? And, and if you find out that they violate uh, what we call Gödel's theorem, which is a, a theorem of of Kurt uh, Gettel, which is a, 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 a very important German mathematician mm -hmm. who showed that human awareness of mathematics is, is not reducible to algorithms, that it's trans-algorithmic, that means it's transphysical, mm -hmm. then of course that being, that alien being who's doing, you know, trans-algorithmic mathematics, having conceptual ideas, right, this, this being who has a, uh, obviously an experience of, of consciousness after physical death, or, or uh, you know, uh, has an awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. Hey, wait a minute. That being's got a soul. Mm -hmm. That being is not the result of a merely physical or organic evolutionary process. Now, if that being has a soul, there's only one cause of that soul, as Augustine said a long time ago. That has to be a transphysical cause, namely, God, transphysical means beyond physics, mm -hmm. beyond physical processes, beyond physical structures, beyond physical laws. So of course, the minute you say this being has a transphysical soul, you gotta have a transphysical cause, namely God. Mm -hmm. And if God created that being with a soul, then you have one responsibility, Chuck, you're going to have to catechize them about Jesus Christ and try to baptize them. Okay. That's what you have to do. And, of course, that being might say just like, you know, when
when the, the missionaries came to the New World and they, they met these people and they said, hey, have you ever heard of Jesus? No, we haven't. And of course, what did they do? They catechized him and baptized him. And they were glad to hear of him. I, I, I'm going to suppose that if, if these beings are made in the image and likeness of God, they're going to have a transcendental awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, which means God has been speaking mm -hmm. to them just as he's been speaking to us, in which case it's time to give them the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay. which I think they will open themselves up to uh, in, in their hearts because they will see Jesus as the, uh, you know, the highest dimension, uh, the zenith mm -hmm. uh, of unconditional love and the revelation of, of unconditional love and see that as the good that everybody in previous times did and understand the resurrection of Jesus as we understand it in its significance and therefore they will be catechizable and therefore they will be baptizable. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think, uh, no, ha have we discovered that? No. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, I don't think this is going to happen by a merely trans, uh, by a merely physical or organic process. Mm -hmm. This is going to happen, right, because of uh, some transphysical cause. And so, um, uh, uh, again, we have a responsibility to evangelize uh, those intelligent alien people who I really believe will be open to the good news because they have the transcendental desires in their hearts. So you're and, saying uh, same that as, uh, as before. we can proselytize uh, uh, people from other planets? That's, uh, that's acceptable. Okay. That's acceptable. Oh, okay. I just uh, wanted absolutely. to make sure that. And, uh, okay. and that's right. That's right. The federal government will not interfere, not interfere with this process. Not interfere in the, the church is okay. I just wanted to make sure. Here, here's another question for you. It's, it's a free alien world. Oh, okay, okay, I, I see, okay. That's, uh, that's not sheep stealing in that way. Okay, so here's another question for you. It's kind of interesting and it just popped up not too long ago in the news. Recently, this person writes to us, I read a meta study which examined uh, myriad strands of DNA and stated that 90% yep. of all animals appeared at the same time. That's 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. This seems to point to a creator too. Have you heard of this study? Do you have any thoughts on it? Thanks and God bless you. And this is from Daniel. Daniel, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, now this study, there is a great deal of validity to this study. Uh, and let me just describe it very briefly for you and then give you some of the, the, uh, the, the dimensions of the study and then tell you why it's significant in terms of your question. Uh, this was done by two researchers, uh, Dr. Mike uh, uh, Stöckel is how you would pronounce it in German, mm -hmm. and Dr. David Thaler. Uh, Stöckel was from the, um, uh, the um, uh, Rockefeller University in New York and uh, Thaler was from the University of Basel. Mm -hmm. But the, the main thing is these guys um, actually decided that they would go to what's called the GenBank database, which is this huge database of well over 100,000 species, and that they were going to analyze what's called mitochondrial DNA mm -hmm. in 100,000 species. Now, why mitochondrial DNA? What is mitochondrial DNA anyway? Well, there's nuclear DNA. That's the kind of DNA that gives you your uh, sort of DNA um, um, imprint that's going to make you the specific a kind of okay. physical being that you are. Not the spiritual being that you are, not the soul that you are, but it's going to make you the physical being that you are. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're not talking about that because that's too highly differentiated. But you have, we all have another kind of DNA called mitochondrial DNA, which we got from our common ancestor between 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that common ancestor ancestor is called mitochondrial Eve. Mm -hmm. Now that ancestor, she has given every single person in this world a little remnant of simplified DNA, if I can put it that way, mm -hmm. that all of us share, every single solitary human being in the world, Africa, China, United States, whatever, all of us have this uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA that comes from her, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, down through the mother's lineage. Now, what, uh, uh, what Steckel and, and Thaler did was they isolated a particular gene which gives rise to what we call DNA barcoding. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And the best part about mitochondrial DNA is you can compare it from species to species. Mm -hmm. Can't do that with nuclear DNA, yeah. but you can do it with mitochondrial DNA. And now we've got this gen bank that has all the barcoding of hundreds of thousands of species, right? Uh, you know, and, and they go into this thing and meticulously go through all of these species looking for two things. First, are there a lot of variations in the species, right, um, you know, that, that would indicate that there is longevity. So the more variations in the mitochondrial DNA barcode that you have, so as you're examining, let's say, you know, a thousand uh, 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 birds in a particular species of bird, you're analyzing about 1,000 of these babies, you want to see if there's any kind of variations between the birds. If there's lots of variations, then you're going to suppose that there is also a lot of development there. Mm -hmm. And then if there's development, that's going to take time. And so you can then make a time projection for it. Now what they found, interestingly, is this is absolutely bizarre. Mm -hmm. It goes against, you know, all, you know, traditional evolutionary theories. And by the way, it's reported in a very reputable journal, the Journal of Human Evolution. It's a good scientific journal. So the, the, the point, though, is that they found that there was very little genetic variation in the mitochondrial DNA in the barcoding, as it were, of this one particular gene from species to species mm. and within the species itself. That means that those species, they didn't go back very far. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. None of the species go back very far. Human species, like <clears throat> Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, we, we <clears throat> are, are you know, not more than 200,000 years old. The same thing with bird species of various kinds. In fact, 90% of all animal species, all 90% uh, of them, all have the same origin date between 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now that's a mind blower right off the top because of course traditional evolutionary theory would say no way this goes back at least to the Cambrian uh, you know explosion which was 500 million years ago mm -hmm. it certainly uh, was there with the survivors you know after 65.5 you know a million years ago we, we have uh, the dinosaurs got wiped out right and about 50 percent of the animal species in the world got wiped out and, and so you know at that juncture there were some survivor 50% of the mm -hmm. species survived and so it's got to go back but no no that's not the case uh, as a matter of fact only 10% of the animal species that we have actually go back longer back to that you know period of 65.5 million years ago or before so this is really bizarre mm -hmm. so that's our first thing is we seem to be around at the same time as all the proliferation of 90% of the animal species of this world. Now, this conclusion holds out, and it may well hold out. I'm telling you, when you analyze that kind of data meticulously, it's pretty hard to avoid the conclusion that Steckel and, and Thaler drew. Mm -hmm. that the second conclusion that they drew, and this is even more of a mind blower, is that the, 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 what we call the boundaries between species they're hard boundaries. So what we can do is we can analyze when we have this cross uh, species mm -hmm. mitochondrial DNA investigation, you can actually see whether the boundaries are hard. In other words, is there anything between the species? Do we see any variation or are there like species number one and then there's species number two, mm -hmm. but there's nothing between one and two. Mm -hmm. There's nothing between two and three. And you would expect that in a, in, in, in a complete evolutionary process where there's evolution between mm -hmm. the species, you would expect that there have to be genetic variations between the species. We do not see those continuities. We see instead hard genetic boundaries. What does this mean? It looks initially like we are not evolving from other species. Like we didn't come from chimpanzees, mm -hmm. right? That we're our sort of species, the chimpanzees are their species. And even we may not have come that directly from other hominids. Mm -hmm. uh, they arise about the same time with hard genetic boundaries as well. 
So Australopithecus, right? Homo erectus, right? And of course, ho Homo uh, sapiens neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens sapiens. It looks like we actually, not, we may not have evolved from one another. Now the fossil mm -hmm. evidence seems to indicate it. There's some elements of nuclear DNA that indicate uh, that, that uh, we, that humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, did mate with some Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true, so there's Neanderthal DNA in some human beings however to be frank that just means that they mated it didn't mean that they came from one another mm -hmm. so we may have to change our entire image mm -hmm. of what the evolutionary picture looks like we may have to drastically you know um, uh, bring it down uh, a huge amount and we may have to count uh, for the fact that species uh, you know did not evolve out of uh, one another uh, you know from a higher species from a lower species mm -hmm. right uh, we're just going to have to uh, redraw the entire evolutionary picture now uh, the first thing you, you want to do uh, though um, um, I forgot uh, the Daniel. first thing Daniel. is uh, Daniel the first mm -hmm. thing we want to do Daniel is we, we don't want to um, uh, you know, draw this conclusion immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, better let the rest of the scientific community look at it. So in other words, the, the thing about science is you must have other scientists look over the same data, do the same thing, perhaps do another test that might test the data from a different perspective. You want to make sure you've got multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. But right now, because of the extensiveness of the study and the careful nature in which the study was conducted, it looks right now like it, it may be the case that we're going to redraw the evolutionary picture. Uh, so you really hit upon a remarkable finding mm -hmm. of late. Uh, unfortunately, module number three of the seven essential modules and module number three of our uh, CredibleCatholic.com doesn't account for the study yet, mm -hmm. uh, but don't worry, yours truly will be right. putting the new He's data up there. Uh, <laughs> we'll get on it as soon as possible. <laughs> That's what's great about websites, too. They can be updated so easily. You know, you're not talking about yeah, having to be published exactly. in a book, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so let me ask you, that I, we have uh, uh, another question. I want to see if we can skip ahead to question number four that I think okay. kind of uh, fits into what you were just talking about. Uh, get it up on mm -hmm. the screen. There it is. Uh, question of dear father, science has calculated that the earth was created some billions of years ago. Does it mean that the earth existed for some billions of years before Jesus Christ came to establish the kingdom of God on earth? Where do Adam and Eve fit into this? And this is Denelson from Cameroon, calling uh, from Africa, letting us know as a question for him uh, about uh, this. And, and where does it fit in? We talk about even you say, well, 90% was, but 10% wasn't. And you, mm -hmm. you mentioned some kind of mitochondrial mm -hmm. Eve. Is that the same Eve as mm -hmm. the Eve of Scripture? Yeah. All of those questions are super good. Mm -hmm. So fasten your seatbelt. Here is the basic picture. And again, the Catholic Church uh, holds to this picture, uh, right? We do allow um, uh, belief in evolution. Uh, going all the way back to uh, Humani Generis, that's the encyclical of Pope Pius XII in 1951, I believe, where he said, you know, all Catholics can believe in evolution. Um, uh, he, um, in, in that uh, same encyclical, he uh, says, though, that we have to believe in a, trans, a unique transphysical soul created by God for every individual. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem anymore. And it's certainly, uh, after last week's broadcast, mm -hmm. It certainly isn't a problem uh, for, um, uh, for any of us to believe in light of the evidence of near-death experiences and mm -hmm. terminal lucidity. So given all of that, the, the point is the Catholic Church does allow us to believe in mm -hmm. evolution. Uh, what is the best uh, picture scientifically uh, that we have right now that I think would be adhered to by a majority of, of Catholic scientists and also Catholic uh, prelates who are aware mm -hmm. uh, of this evidence? I would say it's the following. Uh, first of all, our um, Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Is there a lot of evidence for this? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is a ton of evidence for this. It's both solar evidence and it's also uh, earthly evidence. So it's, it's, it comes from both the sun and from 
uh, the Earth itself. So we have a, a lot of geological evidence and we have a lot of astronomical evidence. I don't want to go into it uh, today, but it's enormous. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to deny this conclusion. Secondly, we do have fossils. And again, these are fossils of the earliest bacterial life forms. Mm -hmm. So this would be like single-celled bacteria, like an amoeba, protozoa, right? So this would be uh, maybe a flagellum. I'm not sure whether they have a fossil of a flagellum or not. Mm -hmm. But the main thing to remember is that this probably goes back to about 3.9 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. So there does seem to be bacterial life going back to 3.9 billion years. Now, if you keep going down, uh, you will see that there is a, a steady progression of, of evolution that takes place. Uh, and, and what occurs mm -hmm. over that uh, time period is it basically leads to a, a period 500 million years ago where you have this huge proliferation of animal species called the Cambrian Explosion. Mm -hmm. So about 500 million years ago. And then, as I just uh, said, uh, this explosion continues, you know, for, for a long, long time, uh, even resulting in dinosaurs, etc. Mm -hmm. And then we know 65.5 million years ago, an asteroid hit the Earth of a significant size. Mm -hmm. When that asteroid hit the Earth, it wiped out the entire dinosaur population mm -hmm. and 50% of uh, the animal species in the world, about 50%. Uh, kept on mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, in, in accordance with the, the, the new study, mm -hmm. uh, what seems to have happened is 10% of the, of the animal species we have today uh, came from that remnant 50% mm -hmm. uh, back there 65.5 million years ago. Mm -hmm. However, 90% seem to have, boom, just come right up and side by side, just like the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. huge proliferation of species comes up, which, as you pointed out, suggests a creator. It mm -hmm. does suggest some kind of a creation event. Mm -hmm. it, it really does not lend itself to one species coming from another, certainly not in a purely uh, um, a Darwinian way. Mm -hmm. There's just no way uh, uh, Darwin is going to survive, uh, you know, this new discovery if it, if it remains, uh, you know, to be validated. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it, it, it probably will. But the main thing right now is that um, in, in light of all of this, you have the sheer pro proliferation of species. It does seem to have some kind of non-organic, non-physical, transcendent, non-genetic cause, mm -hmm. which I would call, in general, God. Mm -hmm. And so why not call it, you know, the creator or God? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it does seem to have that, uh, that um, uh, indication. And now, uh, looking at that, uh, we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, well, well okay, 200,000 years ago, is that our common ancestor? We do know that mm -hmm. our, we do know who our common ancestor is genetically. Mm -hmm. And that genetic common ancestor, as I just said, is mitochondrial Eve. Mm -hmm. We also know the ancestor of every, the common ancestor of every male. Mm -hmm. uh, that is called, his name is Y chromosome Adam. Mm -hmm. He does come from uh, 200,000 years ago, approximately as well. Mm -hmm. So a mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam come about 200,000 years. Okay. Now, is that our common ancestor? Uh, don't know yet, uh, honestly, mm -hmm. but my thinking is it is not. Hmm. It's our genetic common ancestor, huh. but I don't know if it's our ensouled common ancestor. Might be, but here's the problem. For 130,000 years, um, those ancestors of mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam they were basically sitting around the border of Namibia and Angola and basically cracking nuts and eating bananas and being content. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to tell you, they weren't doing much. Mm -hmm. Then 70,000 years ago, something happens. Hmm. All of a sudden, our genetic ancestor, because these came from mitochondrial uh, Eve and Y chromosome Adam, but some uh, uh, you know, and I'm going to say two ancestors, mm -hmm. and sold Eve and ensouled Adam, given souls by God, 
they come up and what do they suddenly do? Mm -hmm. They start develop, developing conceptual languages with really sin, what we call significant syntax. Right. I would indicate that this has to come from a soul, and I have a lot of evidence for okay. it in a book I wrote called The Soul's Upward Yearning, but you can get it free of charge by looking at module two right. of uh, uh, CredibleCatholic.com. There's all this evidence for conceptual language having to come from a soul. But what's my point? Yep. All of a sudden, human beings start doing what no chimpanzee can do, mm -hmm. what no other animal species ever, sh uh, what no other hominid species ever showed signs of doing. And, and what is that? They're starting to speak with direct objects and predicates. Right. They can s differentiate between man bites dog and dog bites man. Mm -hmm. A little child will chortle at, you know, man bites dog. Mm -hmm. uh, Nim Chimsky, the most highly trained chimpanzee in the world with 170 uh, um, uh, uh, signs in artificial uh, sign language, right. cannot do this. It right. cannot pass the syntax test. So suddenly human beings start speaking conceptually. Suddenly human beings start crafting, you know, logs where they're notching it out. So these are obviously counting sticks. Right. Things of that nature. They're already doing arithmetic. There's no evidence of this before 70,000 years. And they start applying that arithmetic, you know, to, to, to the situation right. around them. All of a sudden, you know, they start burying their dead. They never buried their dead uh, previously. And they bury them with objects that they can take with them into the right. next life. They never had a sense of afterlife. We have no evidence of, of, of uh, you know, um, uh, pre-70,000 years ago man, you know, uh, bear. all of a sudden they start drawing pictures in caves. 70,000 years right. ago, human beings become symbolic and artistic. So what, what's the point? All of a sudden, these people, I'm going to call them, right. all of a sudden, they are doing uniquely human things, which by all accounts, if you read that book, The Soul's Upward Yearning, or you go to module two of CredibleCatholic.com, mm -hmm. you will see these, right. all these activities require a soul. And in addition to that, it, they re require that we have this awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, right. and home. Yeah. Can't explain that right now. But I right, think this happened seven Because the other thing they started to probably keep track of was time and we're out of it for this portion of the show so we're going to take a break and you can continue in the second half with your point there father we'll be back in a moment the one and only father spitzer's on a roll you won't want to miss it stay with us we'll be back in a minute Thank you so much for staying with us at the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. I'm Doug Keck as we continue on with Father Spitzer talking about evolution, the Bible, and science. Specifically, as we rejoin with Father, uh, we got some great questions for you. Uh, continuing, because I think uh, some people have uh, anticipated some of our topics. Here's another question that was sent in to us. Uh, dear Father, to believe the big theory and evolutionary theory, and maybe it's the Big Bang, uh, don't we have to believe that God introduced death at the creation of the universe? In order to create Adam and Eve, wouldn't the many previous evolutionary species have to die to evolve into humans? This is Joseph. Uh, you know, theologians have been discussing it for many, many, many uh, years, if not mm -hmm. practically for over a century. Uh, the, the main uh, thing to remember is, yes, was there organic death prior uh, to uh, uh, 200,000 years ago? And the answer is yes. We know that the bacteria that we have fossils for uh, 3.9 billion years ago died. We know that all those dinosaurs died. Uh, we know that, you know, um, um, you know the, that 50 percent of the species died 65.5 million years ago because of that asteroid and so forth. We also know, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that um, 
uh, many, many uh, animals died. We've got, frankly, all the oil we're using in our uh, in our uh, mm -hmm. cars uh, come from a lot of decayed plant and animal bodies that died. Mm -hmm. And so we know that, yes, there was death before 200,000 years ago when we have our genetic ancestors and what I was just calling our ensouled ancestors, ensouled Adam and Eve, uh, maybe 70,000 years ago, yes, there was death. So uh, how do we reconcile that with the whole aspect of, mm -hmm. of death that Jesus talks about. I believe that in soul, and this is, is, one, is a, an answer that many theologians give, in soul Adam and in soul Eve had the potential through their soul for eternal life and eternal life with God. So they did have something that other animal species did not have. They had a soul which could um, allow them uh, to, to continue to live. What we've been talking about in the previous week when mm -hmm. we were talking about near-death experiences, etc., when we talked about the revelation of Jesus, the promise of eternal life, mm -hmm. they had this transphysical soul. So they had, uh, mm -hmm. as it were, what I'm going to call the pure possibility of eternal life right then and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I truly believe that uh, God intended them for eternal life. And of course, he still intends us for etern mm -hmm. eternal life, but I do believe what happened was when they were given their souls, they had an awareness of interiorly of the, internal, of the eternal life to which they were called because they also had an awareness of the God, the Creator, who made them in His image with that very eternal soul. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe for, that, that the Scripture is right. I do think Satan comes into the picture you know, he just, you know, and I think this happened about mm -hmm. 70,000 years ago. Irresistibly, of course, he's right there, Johnny on the spot, to tempt Adam and Eve. And what does he tempt them with? He tempts them with, God is ahead of you guys. And so he doesn't want you to be like a God. So if you want to be like a God, you got to do your own thing. Mm -hmm. Don't listen to God. Mm -hmm. And of course, out of sheer ego ego e egotism, right, and, and, and sheer, you know, pride mm -hmm. and sheer desire to be like God. I think the Bible is so mm -hmm. insightful, I can't tell you how insightful. This is like right on the marker. Mm. I think our uh, ensouled ancestors, Adam and Eve, uh, I think they fell and I think a whole new kind of death came into the world, into the universe, a whole new kind of death. And that death was, of course, that our, the body was going to die and that the soul would have to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, that was not in the world. I think also the idea of pain, well, was there suffering in pain, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in the world before Adam and Eve? Yes. Okay. Yes, animals suffered when they died. Mm -hmm. when, an, an, when a dinosaur ate another dinosaur, there was screams of pain, just like there would be screams of pain when the coyotes outside of my house are eating a rabbit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that they, there was suffering. However, there was not reflective suffering. Hmm. So in other words, human beings, remember when I was talking a, a, a while back about self-consciousness? Mm -hmm how I'm aware of the cup, but I'm also aware of being aware of the cup. Mm -hmm. So for all intents and purposes then, uh, you know, I can actually be aware of my suffering. Mm -hmm. I can not only suffer, right, but I can be aware of my suffering and even be depressed mm -hmm. because of my awareness of my suffering, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you come home from uh, work and your dog is wagging his tail. He's so happy to see you. He's genuinely happy right. to see right. you. But he's not aware that he's happy to see you. Hmm. And when you leave, yes, he's sad that you're going. But he's not going, oh my gosh, I'm aware of my sadness and mm -hmm. I'm going to get depressed. Mm -hmm. Or I'm aware of my happiness and I'm going to be elated. Mm -hmm. Well, what came into the world when we decided to, you know, to choose ourselves over God, when we fell, what came into the world was reflective suffering. And that's a hundred thousand times worse than unreflective suffering. Mm -hmm. We now have a reflective sense of our death.
because we do have a transphysical soul and it was caused by our fall. And I think that is a hundred thousand times worse than a dog who, you know, beloved as can be, right. just goes into a corner and quietly dies, mm -hmm. right? And so forth. You know, it's, it's, we think about it, we obsess about it. My point being, that yes, this is the new kind of death and suffering mm -hmm. that came into the world, and it comes into the world part, you know, in uh, virtue of mm -hmm. our having a transcendent, self-reflective soul, and that is the reason uh, that we suffer. And also, what came into the world is we lost our vision. Of, you know, remember I said we have an awareness mm -hmm. of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and and home, but we have that awareness in a very obscure way. We lost the much purer awareness of God, that much purer awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home mm -hmm. in our fall. I mean, God gave Adam and Eve what they wanted, right? They wanted to be on their own. They wanted to be likened unto God. Here, try and be like God without mm -hmm. me. Go ahead. Well, he didn't make us fall completely, mm -hmm. right? But he made us fall in the sense that we, we lost, uh, you know, maybe up to 49% of that vision of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. Mm -hmm. and, and we see life now dimly as, you know, as, as, as through almost right. a, a filter, you know. And so the key thing that, that we have to remember right. is all these things, what we call concupiscence now, comes into the world. Our own egocentric desires right. have have. A, a good strong hand on us and, and of course we have to choose those transcendentals over against the pain of our egocentricity and so all this stuff came into the world I think it came in 70,000 years ago okay. and I do think it comes right. uh, from two uh, single ancestors who were ensouled and since that time God has been giving a unique transphysical soul to all the ancestors uh, uh, to all the uh, excuse me progeny right. of okay. our uh, original ancestors right. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows Father's web address for all the dog lovers and cat lovers out there who have, have concerns on his perspective of uh, whether dogs, uh, oh how they suffer or how depressed they may or may not be. But that being said, we have another question for you. Uh, dear Father, I see the earth prior to man as in a state of original justice, but not a place of peace and harmony. Shouldn't this time of evolving be viewed as a time without sin since nature was already pretty violent? Question mark. A creature would have to have knowledge of sin in order to commit sin, correct? Any thoughts? And this is from Patrick. Yeah, Patrick, I think I, I would give the same explanation I, I gave to the previous question. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, you know, yes, at the, at, in, uh, uh, prior to human beings, so I'm just going to say prior to our first and sold ancestors 70,000 years ago. Uh, I, I don't think there was any sin uh, in, in, in the world there for that 4.5 million years uh, minus 200,000, right? I, 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 billion years, excuse mm -hmm. me, billion years minus 200,000 million. So, uh, uh, excuse me, minus 200,000. It's a lot of and years. So I don't think, <laughs> it's a lot of years. Right, right. And so I, I don't think there was any sin because there wasn't any self-awareness. You're absolutely mm -hmm. correct, Patrick. And I don't think also uh, that, that, um, that there was, um, uh, you know, um, a state of mm -hmm. what you might call, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, painlessness or, or perfect, uh, you know, bliss within mm -hmm. the world. As I just mm -hmm. said, I think there, there was plenty of pain mm -hmm. and there was plenty of death. Uh, no question about that. But, uh, of course, everything, you know, in, in uh, uh, you know, the, the two first chapters of Genesis, mm -hmm. it's all about what? human beings mm -hmm. you know so Genesis 1 we are the pinnacle of that creation right in Adam and Eve we're the ones that fell and so what we're talking about is that the original sin which I believe did happen mm -hmm. 70,000 years ago two first parents uh, uh, to two uh, ensouled first parents mm -hmm. I do think that um, uh, that does have an effect on us in the ways that I described but prior to that, okay. no, I don't think there was any sin in the world. And of course, you're right, there was suffering and pain uh, in the world okay. and, uh, and violence as well. Okay, here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, as a biologist, I am familiar with the teaching that says that biology reduces to chemistry and that chemistry reduces to physics. 
At what point mm -hmm. do physics and chemistry become, quote unquote, life? What does the theologian say that life is? Thank you, and this is Robin. I gotta tell you, Robin, that is still one of the most perplexing questions even in, as you, you're a biologist yourself, mm. as you know, biologists have not answered that question. Uh, this is, is the problem. In fact, physicists and chemists have not answered that question. Yes, we can get up to amino acids and we can get to proteins and we can get to very, 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 very sophisticated mm -hmm. ones, you know, like DNA and, and RNA and, and so forth. Yes, we can uh, see all of that as an evolution of physical, mm -hmm. um, what we call physical, chemical, organic uh, compounds. However, uh, when does it become life? Mm -hmm. the and the big answer, the big scientific answer to the question is, we don't know. We don't know what, as it were, ignites this fire that we call self-movement, ignites this fire that we call, you know, uh, metabolism and, 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 and self-desire. What is it that puts it together? Now, if you really want a very insightful, insightful essay, by a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist. His name is Michael Polanyi, P-O-L-A-N-Y-I. And he writes this, well, he's written a whole lot of books on this, uh, you know, and, and, and one of his essays is on the origin of life. And he really thinks that in order to have a living um, uh, cell, right? We're just talking about a single cell here, which I think is what you're describing as a biologist, right? Right. Mm -hmm. In order to get a single cell, you're going to have to get that, uh, you know, metabolic event. And the the the, diff the problem with metabolism is it's ir it's ir it's not reducible completely, right? It's reducible in many ways to chemistry and physics, but there are other elements that are not reducible to chemistry and physics, right? Mm -hmm. The protons that are moving in metabolic activity, there's nothing in the protons to direct them to do metabolic activities. Electromagnetic activities, yes. There's nothing in the chemistry that, that indicates that complex molecules should be doing metabolism. All these parts that are busily working uh, together uh, you know, in this cell mm -hmm. uh, seem to suggest programming, according to Polanyi, who knows chemistry certainly better than I do, right? He's saying that mm -hmm. chemistry cannot explain the, the, uh, the advent of these activities. You're going to need what's called a higher order unity and you're going to get, need a higher order set of laws mm -hmm. for metabolism, for replication or reproduction, and even for instinctual survival. You're going to need some additional laws within that higher order unity that I'm going to call a cell or a living organism, and that uh, we cannot explain with chemistry. It's irreducible, and that's Polanyi's view, and I tell you, this is mm -hmm. a very well-conceived uh, 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 viewpoint, and he articulates it very, very well. He's got a, a two full books on this uh, area, and I think mm -hmm. uh, if you're a, a biologist yourself, you really want to get to it, Michael Polanyi, on the origin of life. Okay, here's another question. This one, if we can put up question number seven, uh, it, it's uh, one that's uh, a little bit uh, on the surface of it is kind of out there on one second sense, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of people, Bible believers, who read the creation mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. account and they wonder, how does this work? Here is the question. Mm -hmm. uh, Dear Father, there's mm -hmm. a question I have about a creation museum in Texas that teaches that the dinosaurs became extinct because they were too large to fit aboard. Noah's Ark, yet science has proven this theory wrong. Do you have any opinions or thoughts on this? As you are certainly yourself a scientist, thank you. And this is from Mike. And of course, mm -hmm. I think we know what the answer is. We've talked about that. Well, what do you say to people who are Bible-believing Christians who read the account from Genesis and yeah. they read this and they find this to be disturbing to their faith? Uh, you know, Noah's yeah. Ark and the dinosaurs and how does this all fit together and I still hold on to my trust in scripture? Yeah, I, I would say, Michael, you know, that it's a tough go, mm -hmm. but here's the thing. The first thing we need to do is go back to the time of the Protestant Reformation. And this doctrine called sola scriptura, 
was a kind of pronounced uh, by really all of the reformers. And what it means is scripture alone. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that is to say, we don't need a church magisterium to teach us or to interpret the scriptures for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we, in our own capacity, can read the scriptures, and that should be sufficient uh, to interpret the scriptures. Well, the Catholic Church has never believed that. We believe there's a combination here of both scripture, uh, of scripture, of course, which is the deposit of faith, and of course, it's the Word of God. And we've also believed that we need a tradition. We need our church to help us interpret that tradition mm -hmm. because there's a myriad of possible interpretations for every possible scripture saying. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can have thousands upon thousands of scripture sayings and you can sort of say, well, there's a conflict between this one and this one and that one and that one. And you can go on and on. And if you don't have a church magisterium to sort the whole thing out, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? You're going to get 30,000 denominations in 500 years. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. Sola Scriptura is dead wrong. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a magisterium, if you don't have teaching, you've got a mess. And the mess is every interpretation that comes up gives rise to a whole other religion. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not going to be a proper ground for anything. Now, what happened, though, once you got Sola Scriptura off the ground, what do you think is the next thing that's going to have to be defended by, let's say, one of our Protestant brethren? They're going to have to defend, in some sense, the, li the literal interpretation of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And this gets down to what we call inspiration. And by the way, there's a nice magisterial teaching on inspiration, mm -hmm. divine inspiration of the Scriptures. And what uh, some people have what's called the dictation view of inspiration, mm -hmm. where God literally comes to the biblical author and says, okay, biblical author, I'm going to dictate this whole thing to you. Get your pen out, your quill out, and write like mad. I'm giving it to you word for word. Now, sola scriptura, I maintain, leads to that kind of uh, what we'll call biblical literalism, which mm -hmm. has to be defended with the dictation view of inspiration. Because, right, that's God's word, you know, and scripture alone will suffice, you know, skip the need for a magisterial teaching, mm -hmm. right, magisterium just right, means teaching, right, and, and so uh, magisterial authority, skip that, right, you can do it all yourself. Well, you're going to be led right down this primrose path. Mm -hmm. And so that's called uh, the dedication. We never, as Catholics, uh, believed in that. St. Thomas Aquinas had a beautiful phrase called, you know, quid quid recipiter as recipiter in, in, in modo recipient, uh, recipientes. Yeah, in other words, well, whatever is received is received in the mm -hmm. manner of the receiver, right? So, so of the receivers. So the, the, the idea is, is that, you know, what we need to do is, is we need in some sense then to, uh, to recover mm -hmm. another view of inspiration that the church has given us. And that is what we'll call the co-participative view of inspiration. What's co-participative inspiration? That means that, yes, God, of course, is inspiring the biblical author, but he's not dictating the scripture mm -hmm. to the biblical author. He's giving it to the biblical author in the way, in the categories of his culture, mm -hmm. in the categories that he can understand. Right. Is the biblical under, uh, uh, author going to understand the methodology of science? No, he hasn't even heard of it. Mm -hmm. Is the biblical author going to understand uh, the mathematics that we use for scientific analysis. No, he's never even done that kind of mathematics. As a biblical author, you get the point. Right. The biblical author is going to understand whatever is received is received in the manner of the receiver according to the cultural categories he's got, according to the age in which he's living, according to the culture in which he lives, and according to his individual dispositions. Mm -hmm. So he's going to frame that truth in a way that is going to be 
um, as it were, uh, you know, appropriate uh, to right. his age. Right. And so uh, the Catholics would say, well, yeah, the ark was appropriate mm -hmm. to his age. There was a flood, mm -hmm. and that flood does seem to have had a remnant, and the remnant seems to have come uh, in, in a, in a, uh, uh, through some kind of a boat. So there's mm -hmm. some kind of a good grounding of that, of that story. But right. of course, the biblical author takes the opportunity to say, this is why, uh, you know, some species died off, but some species did not. Now, is that what we would hold today? Is that what the Catholic mm -hmm. Church holds today? No, okay. we, we do not. So the dinosaurs didn't die right. because they weren't in the ark. Right. You know, I mean, that's just not uh, what we would hold as an asteroid right. wiped about 65.5 uh, million years ago. But the right. point I'm trying to get to is it all goes back to biblical literal, literalism, which goes back to that uh, doctrine of sola scriptura, the part of Luther and, and, and the reformers, and it goes, uh, it, 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 you, if you don't have a magisterium, this is what you're going to come up with every time you're going to be forced into right. a literalism. Now, Pope Pius XII was a great guy. And he wrote this encyclical uh, called Divino Afflante Spiritu, I think mm. in 1943 or 42. Anyway, uh, this was about biblical inspiration, and the Pope made a really important distinction. He said, look, he said that the, the scriptures are to give you sacred truths necessary for your salvation, not scientific truths right. that are correct descriptions or explanations of the physical world as measured through scientific analysis, mathematics, and, 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 and uh, scientific right. method. No. And we have uh, to that, keep but that in mind every week yeah. we watch the show because that's uh, <laughs> core teaching to everything going on. I thought it was wonderful. You pointed out the, the whole Sola Scriptura. I hadn't really put those two together. But if you can give us your blessing yeah. as we end the show, that Absolutely. would be great, Father. Okay. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God give you the blessing of the ages, which is his wisdom, manifest through his love and manifest through the order of the universe and the goodness in which he made all of us and made creation and, of course, the image of himself into which we were made so that through this image of ourselves we may know the true dignity of every human being, including ourselves, and may progress steadily through obedience to his Son and obedience to the church, we may progress steadily into the kingdom of salvation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you uh, next time. And uh, reminding everybody that uh, we'll be back uh, with our program next week and that also uh, as always, we have our family celebration. This one's coming up in November, November 3rd, Jacksonville, Florida. Go to our website and find out more about it. We just about uh, touched on evolution, the Bible, and science. There's a lot more to be said. As you can see, Father had a lot to say. And we'll see you next week when we talk about that. I'm Doug Keck at the heart of Father Spitzer's universe, the intersection of faith and reason. We'll be there. We'll be waiting for you. See you next time.